Hi, everyone. I am so excited to have with me today, Emily Frazee. Hello. Hey. So she is founder and editor of the Total Wine blog, where she tackles issues like fertility awareness, motherhood, and faith. She was our feature guest on this week's episode, What is Fertility Awareness? If you haven't listened to it already, I would highly recommend it. You don't have to have listened to it before you watch this video. Um, so that's a perk. <laughs> it is actually one of our most downloaded episodes so far. And I, I think that's news to Emily. <laughs> Yeah, that is news. <laughs> cool. So right now we are going to answer your questions live. Um, hit us with the good stuff down below in the comment box um, if you have questions and we'll tackle that. Some of you have already sent in your questions, whether it's through Instagram or um, some of you guys have texted us. Um, good friends of ours have asked questions. Um, and uh for, so for those of you who have already submitted your questions, we have written them down and we will ask them during this Q&A. So before we get, us, get started, just a quick disclaimer, we may be talking about topics that can be unsuitable for children. <laughs> so if they are in the room, you may want to save this video for another time. Just click the save button and come back to it later. So... Um, let's start out with the most basic question, but the most complicated. What is fertility awareness? So, Emily, give us your elevator speech. Um, go over any acronyms that we may hear throughout this whole Q&A. Okay. Yeah. So, um, basically, the first thing that I wanted to say about fertility awareness is that it's not the rhythm method. Um, I know that, you know, NFP gets a, rat, a bad, really bad rap because they're like, oh, it doesn't work. It's ineffective. Um, when you go into your OBGYN's office and you see that chart on the wall with, you know, your birth control options and, you know, IUDs and injections are way up here and fertility awareness is like way down here. What they're actually doing is, is they're showing you the perfect use for um, those methods and the typical use for the rhythm method. And um, it's really important to know the distinction between those two numbers. But also, I don't know anybody who uses the rhythm method anymore. Fertility awareness has like come leaps and bounds since the rhythm method in the 1930s um, to become all kinds of different methods. And what it does, each method will look at... Um, either one particular biomarker or a combination of biomarkers, which are uh, monitoring your hormone levels, um, your basal body temperature, and your cervical mucus. So each method is, um, like I said, either looking at those individually or in combination to identify your fertile window. That is the goal of every method of fertility awareness. Now within that, you know, um, you can actually start to identify uh, what might be the causes of fertility issues or hormonal imbalances, not just avoiding or achieving pregnancy. Um, so acronym wise, one of the ones, I mean, it's kind of an alphabet soup when you start talking about fertility awareness. Um, if you get into conversations with people, they might use the acronyms TTA or TTC or TTW. TTA is try to avoid, TTC is try to conceive, and TTW is try to whatever, which really means try to conceive, but, you know, they're they're trying to act all chill about it. Um, <laughs> but FAM and FABM and NFP all describe the same methods. It's just kind of, it's a, probably a different um, religious or values uh from which you would approach it. So NFP is most commonly used by Catholics. Um, FABM, fertility awareness based method, is used by people who don't use barrier methods in conjunction and fertility awareness method is uh, used by those who do use uh, barrier methods or withdrawal. So that's kind of the distinction, some of the alphabet soup. Um, HBC means hormonal birth control. Um, I think that kind of covers most of <laughs> Most of the letters. <laughs> I think so. And, and I think for like the majority of this Q&A, we'll probably use the full name. But just in case we slip up and throw some letters in there, then uh, you, everyone can just rewind and, and see what those acronyms are. Um, uh, yeah. So we have a question. What is the rhythm method? <laughs> you know, I don't even know. 
<laughs> I, I do feel I, like I've seen that yeah. a long time ago on a chart somewhere. And yeah. maybe the it was popular that, back in the day. Yeah, the way that I understand it is basically you you track when your period is. And then what you do is you assume that you have a 14 day luteal phase, which is the period of time between when you ovulate and when you start your period. Um, and then you just say, well, I have a 14 day luteal phase. So if my cycle is 38 or is my, my cycle is 28 days long, I ovulate on day 14. Right. So, yeah. which is not the case because a woman's luteal phase can, can vary widely. A healthy luteal phase can range from 10 to 16 days. Um, and then if you have, uh, progesterone deficiencies, you would actually have a luteal phase that's even shorter than that. Um, so it's not a good way <laughs> to identify your fertile window at all. It's completely inaccurate. Yeah. So you mentioned cervical mucus in your uh -huh. elevator speech. <laughs> um, yes. you're telling me that it has a purpose. Yes. So the reason why you might have to wear panty liners during some times of the month um, is not because there's something wrong with you or because you're dirty or like some of your parts are not working properly. It's a perfectly natural function. And if you uh, fertility awareness methods can teach you how to read and interpret that cervical mucus to give you indications about where you are in your cycle. Um, so you will start to produce mucus whenever your estrogen starts to elevate, which happens uh, leading up to ovulation. And you'll start to notice changes in the consistency, the color, the quality. Um, and all of those things can give us indications not only about where we are in our cycles, but also if our cycles are healthy, our hormone levels uh, where they should be, or is there an imbalance? Um, so by learning a method of fertility awareness and learning how to read cervical mucus, it actually starts to give you potentially a diagnostic tool for a whole range of issues. Yeah, just just a personal story with that. Um, I started seeing an OBGYN at the age of 14 because that's when I started my period. And I had questions about my cervical mucus. I'm like, what is this coming out? And my... O OBGYN said, oh, you just need to wash a little better. And I asked her several times. This wasn't a one-time thing that I asked about. I asked at every okay. appointment. And yeah. so, and literally, um, it was in the last year when I started a fertility awareness method that I realized that it had a purpose and I wasn't some weirdo that had to wear a panty liner all the time. Um, nope. Normal. <laughs> yeah. And I, I actually learned something from my cervical mucus. And, and really, like, at the beginning, when I heard that you had to, like, observe your cervical mucus, I thought that's, that sounds really gross. And that's not something I want to do. But it's extremely informational. And you, you get used to it. Um, it's not so gross after a while. <laughs> It's honestly kind of fascinating after yeah. a little while. You're like, wow, like this really does change. So I do like, um, because you're probably not the first person who's been told that you just need to wash up more. Um, the cervical mucus is produced in what's called the cervical crypts. So if you look at the anatomy of the vaginal canal, um, it's actually being produced in the cervix, which is um, at the end of the vaginal canal, right? So... Um, you can wash all you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's just a natural process. It's a right. natural thing that happens, and it, it's coming from inside your body. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So just just if anybody's <laughs> been told that, like washing, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, let's tackle some of the methods. What are the differences with each of the methods? Um, and tell me, like, what kind of resources you use with each one? And then how do they differ whether you're sexually active or you're not, if there is any difference between them? Right. So the beautiful thing about fertility awareness is you're just identifying your window of fertility. Um and that doesn't change whether you're trying to identify fertility issues, whether you're trying to avoid pregnancy or achieve pregnancy, sexually active or not sexually active. The information is still valuable and you're still going to be using the same methods to understand it. You don't have to change a thing to go between those three things whenever you're practicing these methods. So, <clears throat> again, like I was saying, 
they're going to be looking at those three biomarkers, cervical mucus, uh, basal body temperature, and hormone levels. So um, three methods, Creighton, uh, Billings, and FEMM, F-E-M-M, it's a newer method that was formulated, look predominantly at the cervical mucus symptom. Creighton is going to look at it under granular detail. Billings is going to look more at the uh, uh, vaginal sensation uh, that you feel. And FEM actually incorporates, it's similar to Creighton in the, uh, I think in the level of detail that it looks at mucus. I'm not super familiar with the method, but they also incorporate um, LH tests. So LH is called, is the luteinizing hormone, which is released uh, when you ovulate. So, or released just prior to ovulation. So if you're observing your mucus symptom in conjunction with the LH testic, it kind of, it's a nice, uh, a lot of women like having multiple biomarkers to track. So that's kind of a pro with FEM. Um, symptothermal is looking at the mucus symptom and also uh, the basal body temperature shift. So what happens is, is when you ovulate, your basal body temperature will increase and that shows a, uh, that allows you to confirm ovulation. That's because you have a rise in progesterone after <clears throat> the release of the egg. And the Marquette method uh, uses the clear blue fertility monitor to monitor your hormones over the course of your cycle. So you start testing on a certain day and it's looking for that rise in estrogen and that uh, surge in LH. Um, in addition to that, there's also um, pro-ov tests, which actually look for progesterone. Um, since progesterone is what rises after ovulation, it's a great way to confirm that you've ovulated. Um, and I know that some people will use that in conjunction with any method. So the pro of the, uh, the pro-ov test is that they're less expensive. Um, so Marquette can kind of range on the more expensive side for the materials. Um, symptothermal ranges on the less expensive side. Creighton can become expensive when you start to talk about instruction because you typically have to have follow-ups with instructors. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a quick rundown of methods that I'm familiar with. There's more, but those are the ones that I'm familiar with. Okay, and which do you use? I use Marquette. Marquette. <laughs> I'm a Billings fan. user, and I will say yeah. Billings, it, it was great for me just because, one, I was skeptical, <laughs> and yeah. I didn't want to put all kinds of time and resources into something that I wasn't 100% 100 sure of. Um, yeah. But it's been super informational, and I am a true believer now. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I thought it, that was a great method just to get started out in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I started out in Symptothermal, and I've also used Creighton briefly. Um, I've used Marquette method for the longest amount of time, though. So, okay. yeah. Wonderful. Um, you had mentioned before that um, the Catholic term is natural family planning, or NFP. Um, is this something that is just for Catholics? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's for every woman because it just it just gives you basic information um, about your fertility. Um, you know, of course, like people like to say, oh, it's just birth control. And it's like, well, no, it's not birth control. And it's not just Catholic. It is deeply well researched scientific scientific information that empowers a woman to learn to read her signs of fertility. And then when she does become sexually active, she can share that information with her partner and be like, hey, look, and in and, and really truly kind of promoting a more egalitarian relationship, I think. Um, you know, the thing with birth control is that it kind of puts the onus on the woman, like, you need to take care of that. You need to pop that pill so that we don't have these little problems. And it's, it's really unfair because men are fertile all the time. Mm -hmm. Why are we the ones that have to medicate? Yeah. <laughs> I never did understand how that can be seen as feminist. But anyway, that's another topic. <laughs> right. Um, and and I, I think that's a belief that I had at the beginning, too, is um, Catholics don't believe in birth control. And so they have this other method. And so only Catholics use it because they don't believe in birth control. Um, right. So... Um, Speaking of birth control, can you use a fertility method, fer I'm sorry, fertility awareness method with birth control? Is that uh -huh. a thing? There's, no, 
uh, there's no point. Because the thing is with hormonal birth control is that it's shutting down your natural reproductive system. So you're not ovulating. There's nothing to track. There's nothing to chart. Um, it does not regulate your cycle like it claims to do. It completely, sh completely shuts your system down. And when you do bleed, it's a withdrawal bleed. Um, so you do not have a period unless you ovulate. Uh, any bleeding that you experience over the course of your cycle, if it does not come after ovulation, is not a period. Um, I learned that when I was postpartum. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but anyway, and I, you know, I had never known that before, so I just thought that that was kind of an interesting little tidbit of information. But um, yeah, there's there's really no point to track because you're you're not having a cycle, you're not ovulating. I mean, the only thing that it would confirm is that you're on the pill. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which you already knew, um, yeah. So it, it's 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 definitely an either or, um, definitely not both and. Well, can you use any type of contraception with fertility awareness methods? Yeah. So for Catholics, obviously, no. <laughs> Um, but for non-Catholics, uh, barrier methods don't interfere as long as it's not hormonal. Uh, a hormonal method of contraception. Um, barrier methods withdrawal are technically still appropriate. Yes. So uh, full disclosure, that's what me and my husband do. We use different barrier ma methods in addition to the fertility awareness methods of um, abstaining on certain days or um, having sex on certain days that I know that I'm not fertile. And so we use a combination and I'm evangelical, so I'm allowed <laughs> <laughs> jokes <laughs> um but Maybe yeah convert. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it, so it doesn't matter your faith it doesn't matter if if you have no faith essentially um right. you you can still use a fertility awareness method yeah that's kind of a funny thing that uh you know people who you know don't have any religious affiliation whatsoever but you know are very much into organics and clean living um, there's actually a lot of crossover with that community as well, because they've recognized that that's, I mean, birth control, it's kind of hypocritical to be like, well, I'm going to eat organic, but then I'm going to pump my body full of all of these synthetic hormones. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've gotten a few questions. Um, <clears throat> does health insurance cover any of the materials you need to be successful in tracking your cycle? Like the clear blue uh, no. fertility monitor you mentioned. But sometimes if you have an HSA or you have like one of those types of accounts, sometimes you can go back and get reimbursed for it. Um, but you'll have to, you would have to check with your insurance company to see if that was possible. But insurance does not directly cover any of this, which is criminal. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Actually, it, yeah. I'll, I'll touch on this later, but I was Googling yesterday, um, natural family planning doctors or fertility awareness doctors. And um, one of the things that came up was the insurance Cigna, and they were, like, really disparaging towards fertility awareness methods. Yeah. And yeah. so there, you, you'll see a lot of that kind of language used in insurance companies just so that they don't have to cover it. Yeah, and also, I mean, big pharma birth control is a big money maker. Mm -hmm. So you yep. don't really want people off the pill cause you lose money. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then along those lines, um, another question that we received, have you found that many OBGYNs are open to fertility aware awareness based methods, meaning they would be able to give insight and encouragement to their patients in reference to these methods? Sadly, no. I cannot tell you the number of times I have been laughed out of a doctor and I'm not the only one. Like most women that I talk to, this is a huge problem. It's huge. Um, but I do talk to women who have had good experiences with doctors. Um, what I would tell you is this is, this is real. This is factual information. When you go into a doctor's office and you tell them that you want to use fertility awareness and NFP and they laugh you out the room, they think that you're using the rhythm method. And you're not. Like mm -hmm. I said, I, I don't really know how to use the rhythm method. I don't know a single person who does. Fertility awareness has come so far in over 100 years. Birth control hasn't really advanced at all in the formula. 
you know, maybe in the way that we administer it, we can do injections and implants and sweet Lord IUDs. Um, and I hear nothing but horror stories from these things, Mm -hmm. but the, the, um, the formula itself has not changed, right? It's antiquated. It's so old hat. And fertility awareness is just, I mean, it's leaps and bounds. So what I would say is when you go into your doctor's office, be prepared to get laughed out of the room, but hold your ground. You like research the information and go in there and be like, no, 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 look, here's what it is. Here's what I'm doing. And I've heard from women who go in there with that confidence. And I know it's hard to do because, I mean, for me, when I go to the OBGYN, it's, it's a very vulnerable experience, mm-hmm. right? Like you're not exactly on your A game with like, I am a confident woman here to just tell you what's what. Um, but I have heard good stories from women who have gone in and explained to their doctor, like, no, I use the Marquette method. Here's how effective it is. Here's how it works. And their doctors are actually open. They're like, really? Like, can you give me some more information about this? I have heard that happening when women go in there with that, with mm-hmm. that attitude and, armed with that information. Right. And that happened to me. Um, so I was seeing an OBGYN and an endocrinologist because I have uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a hormonal um, imbalance. And um, my endocrinologist said, oh, what's that? <laughs> and it just blew my mind that that wasn't something that was taught to them in medical school. That right. I mean, even if, if they weren't interested in learning about the different methods or getting in the weeds on it, they should know that they may have patients that use these methods. Um, yeah. And then uh, my OBG, OBGYN was like, okay, and that was the extent of our conversation. And, and there's just this like mutual silence between us on that. But see so you back here for nine months. I've right. done that one before. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um. But there, I, I have seen uh, an OBGYN, and this, this kind of ties in the insurance and, um, and then like uh, fertility awareness friendly uh, OBGYN questions. Um, there are OBGYNs, they're usually um, a, like a religious practice or a Catholic practice, and um, they are your typical OBGYNs and they bill as OBGYNs, but they also teach the methods of fertility awareness methods. And so you can, you can find those in different parts of the U.S. Yeah. So what those are, they're called NAPRO doctors, N-A-P-R-O. Um, NAPRO technology was developed in conjunction with the Creighton method. So what those doctors are using is they have been specifically trained to look at a Creighton chart and be able to use that as a diagnostic tool to formulate a plan of treatment. That doesn't mean that they can't look at the charts from other methods. Um, It's just that um, cervical mucus contains so much information, which is what Creighton specifically charts. Um, But it it contains so much information about your hormones. So learning to chart with that and then using that um, as a diagnostic tool is really, really powerful. And they do exist. (laughs) They are hard to find and you might have to drive a ways. I've, you know, I know women who've had to drive like two, three hours to go see these doctors. Like that's not uncommon. Um, but you know, I, I, I think there's hope because the more we talk about this kind of stuff, like we're doing right now, and the more we inform women and say like, Hey, look, you do have options. Start talking, Mm -hmm. you know, like talk to, talk to your doctor, talk to, you talk to other women. And like, I think that, I think that we can, we can start some stuff. Um, (laughs) right. Well, (laughs) we can start to like, you know, make, make, uh, the demand meet or make the supply meet the demand, create the mm -hmm. demand and be like, look, we want this. Let's do it. On on that same topic, how how does someone find a doctor who is NFP friendly? And I've heard this question so many times, and yeah. the answer is, I'll oh, just just find a doctor who can teach you fertility awareness. And I right. feel like that sets people up for failure because, yep. like I said earlier, I googled that and nothing came up. I live in a major city. And Uh if I'm not finding it just by Google in my major city, imagine someone who lives in a, in a smaller area and has no clue where to start. 
So right. how, how would someone go about finding a doctor or an instructor for these methods? Mm -hmm. So I kind of tried to address that problem a little bit on my website. If you go um, to TotalWine.com, I've got a tab called Real NFP Talk. If you scroll down, I list out the five methods that um, I talked about at the beginning of the and I put the homepage links for each one of those methods. On their homepage, you should be able to find, you should be able to get connected with an instructor. Um, so that would be step one. Um, also, you know, there's all kinds of Facebook groups um, that you could plug into, um, and I'd be happy to share some of those. They tend to be like more, um, if they're not uh, geared towards a specific method, they do tend to be, you know, a bunch of Catholics. <laughs> Just full disclosure. Um, but what one of the things you can do is you can go into those groups and say like hey here's where i live does anybody know of an instructor or a napper friendly doctor who's in this area now the beautiful thing about instructors is uh, most of them will do distance learning um, i learned marquette and creighton actually through doing skype and google video um, so most of them are set up to be able to do that. So that does make it more accessible. I actually do know a lot of people who teach Creighton, um, a few people who teach Fem Billings and uh, Marquette. So, I mean, if anybody's watching this and wants connected with an instructor, Instagram accounts, you know, whatever, um, contact me after this. I'd love to set you up. Um, but the best place to find a doctor outside of that is once you do get set up with an instructor, they can probably help you a lot, um, to, cause you know, they know kind of what's going on. They've probably had clients already ask this. Um, even if they don't live in your area, they might have colleagues who do, or they, you know, every, but once you kind of get into this world, you find that everybody's pretty well interconnected. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, not to make it so culty or anything, but <laughs> <laughs> right. No, my husband uh, said this the other day. He was like, "It's like a cult." No, like, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. I'm kidding. Not to be offensive to those who are against cults or in cults. <laughs> right, right. Not exclusive. <laughs> um, one of the questions we received, um, and a couple of them about birth control, um. If you're skeptical of claims about birth control that we've been talking about, where do we get more information? And um, is there any reputable research that you've seen that correlates to the use of hormonal birth control to infertility issues? Oh, um, specific research on that I'm not familiar with. Um, I know people who could get it for me, um, but... For information on the pill, actually on the tab that I talked about, I actually went, if you scroll a little bit further down below the section with the methods, I actually do include links to articles that go into the history of how birth control was formulated. Um, you know, in the conservative movement, we're very familiar with Margaret Sanger as being a eugenicist and a proponent of abortion, but few know that she actually was uh, behind the formulation of birth control. Um, and the story of how that came about, I mean, it's, it's criminal. Um, it's really, it's, I don't, I do not, it's absolutely baffling to me <laughs> that this is feminist, you know, like mm -hmm. the feminist, I don't know. I've said that already, but, um, yeah, I would start there. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Oh, also the CDC actually just came out and changed their, uh, effectiveness rates for fertility awareness methods. I do have that linked in there as well. Um, oh, that reminds me. Okay, so here's a good source. Natural Womanhood. Um, they are a non-religiously affiliated organization. Um, they, they have, they're an incredible resource for all types of, uh, research and information about birth control, fertility awareness, how to live it, you know, like all the stuff. So I would, mm -hmm. uh, Natural Womanhood, just Google Natural Womanhood. I can't remember if it's .org or .com, um, you know, and that'll take you to all kinds of different places. So. <laughs> yeah, there was actually a segment done by the Today Show, I think last August, around that time, and um, it was called Womanhood Disruptors, and there's uh -huh. um, a, a video, it's still out there, of a, re a researcher who looked into the effects of birth control and what it does to the mind 
And I think that's really important because it it affects yeah. everything that you do, including how you choose a partner. Mm-hmm. And that's Is that Dr. Sarah Hill. Yes, Sarah Hill. Yes, she is fantastic. Um, I follow her on Instagram, and she came out with a book called Your Brain on Birth Control. Mm-hmm. Um, good, good stuff. Like, yes. just mind-blowing information. Yeah. And and she, she she's a secular doctor. She has no, like, hidden agenda, no political things, you know. So um, be, a very good voice uh, to listen to. Yeah, there's a lot of secular voices, actually, that are speaking out for fertility awareness. Um, Fertility Friday uh, is an account on Instagram. Um, And, of course, I follow all these accounts on Instagram that I don't know the actual person's name, and I always feel bad. (laughs) Um, She wrote uh, Lisa Hendricks Jackson, I think is her name. But she wrote, um, and she's African-American, and she wrote a book called The Fifth Vital Sign. Um, all about fertility awareness. It's like fascinating stuff. I love like her account is chock full of amazing information. It's really, really good stuff. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And Emily, uh, Emily's Instagram total wine, um, is it, she follows all kinds of accounts on, uh, fertility yep. awareness. <laughs> and so you can ju- essentially just go to her Instagram or I think you list them in, in some of your stuff too. I do have a couple of posts where I listed them, but seriously, if anybody's watching and y'all want to get connected with some of these, like find me, you know, contact me through my website, Facebook or Instagram. I'll be happy to connect you. Mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to do it. Yeah. So, um, let's talk a little bit about, um, when you don't have the perfect cycle, when you have irregular cycles or hormone imbalances or other, um, things affecting your cycle, um, does, is there fertility awareness methods that help this? Yeah. So that's kind of like one of those common misconceptions that if you have an irregular cycle, you can't use fertility awareness, which is totally wrong. Um, you know, like I've been talking about the Creighton method specifically, it was formulated, uh, trying to help women who were suffering from infertility or just fertility issues to try to get to the root cause of those issues and treat them appropriately. Um, So no, the fact that you have an irregular cycle makes you the perfect candidate for fertility awareness because then you can understand why you have an irregular cycle and treat it appropriately. Sometimes it's a matter of changing your diet. Um, Sometimes it's a matter of adding supplements. Sometimes you might, I mean, depending on what you have going on, it could escalate to something as serious as surgery. That's for like endometriosis uh, for patients, you know, like that. Um, But for women to be able to say like, look, I have a problem. And instead of being told, here's a pill to say, okay, let's figure out why, Mm -hmm. you know, like they find that so empowering and so freeing that you're not just being dismissed. You're not being given a band aid. You're being given a solution and it's not going to be an instant thing. You're going to have to work at it. So, you know, as you know, like charting is it's kind, it's not easy all the time um, because you're learning your body. And the thing with your fertility is it is responding in real time to everything going on in your life. So particularly for women right now, with all of this stress of this global pandemic, my cycles have been bonkers. Okay. And it's just like a nightmare trying to track it right now. But at the same time, it's an incredible way to kind of check in and be like, okay, I'm really stressed out right now. I didn't think I was that stressed out, but my body's telling me otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so I need to kind of figure out, you know, healthy ways to manage my stress, um, to communicate that with my husband. Um, So that's where that kind of self-care you know, mm-hmm. kind of comes in. And, uh, it's a it's a great way, like if you're all about the self-care, it's a great way to do that. I did want to mention too, kind of on the lines of, you know, everybody's cycles being bonkers with COVID. Um, I know that there's women, if anybody's watching who's been pursuing fertility treatments right now that have been put on hold because of COVID, um, there's actually a conference coming out, uh, a free online conference coming out on Monday, starting on Monday, It's this amazing lineup of doctors and fertility awareness instructors who are speaking specifically to women with um, unexplained infertility. So if you go to um, 
www.unexplainedinfertilitysummit.com. Um, you can sign up and get your free pass and start watching um, the conference speakers on Monday. So it's the 25th through the 27th. Um, and if anybody's heard of Cycle Power Summit, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. um, follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Um, but the ladies behind Cycle Power Summit are also putting on um, this conference. It starts on Monday. So, yeah, just that's wanted awesome. to plug that for anybody. Yeah. That's that's really good to know and a really good educational piece, especially for someone who's, you know, just curious. You can mm -hmm. d attend something like that for free and then get really good information. Yep. Get your feet wet. See what um, it's about. So I mentioned before that I have um, polycystic ovarian syndrome and, uh, and really like th these methods have allowed me to figure out what my actual symptoms are. And I didn't realize until I started this, that there were different types of PCOS and how you treat them is very different. So yep. um, they were trying to treat me for insulin resistance and I don't have that and really, I have an inflammation problem. And so I take medications, I take some supplements. And where I was trying to do um, one diet uh, for my PCOS, and that wasn't working, I actually needed to do a low carb diet. And so it's, it's those little trade offs that can make a huge difference and that you can find out just by using a fertility awareness method. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Along those same lines, um, uh, along the same lines of cycles being out of sync, um, what about moms who are breastfeeding and don't have a cycle yet? Right. Yeah, that's the big question because I've been saying this whole time that the whole point is to identify a window of fertility, which you don't really have if you're not ovulating, right? Um, so all methods of fertility awareness have protocols for women who are postpartum and breastfeeding. Um, and I do want to mention that your return of fertility can happen at any time when you're postpartum. Um, I know women who have ecologically breastfed, which means that you breastfeed on demand, even pacifying. Um, and their, they, their fertility returned at six weeks postpartum. And then I know other women who, you know, their kids are weaned, they're two years old, and they're just now getting their cycles back. Right. So it varies so widely woman to woman. For me, my fertility returned actually after both of my kids right around six and a half months postpartum. Um, and I like we had just started doing, you know, solid foods and all that kind of stuff. Um, but just wanted to make mention of that. Now, uh, the most popular method for women who are postpartum is Marquette. Because the way that the method is structured for postpartum is just really cut and dry no guesswork. It's either a fertile day or a not fertile day. Boom, done. Um, so it's really nice. The downside is it gets really expensive because the cost of the sticks can rack up. You have to use one stick a day. Whereas in a normal cycle, you typically only have to use 10 sticks a cycle. There's 30 sticks in a box. So, you know, there's some trade-offs. Um, I know the biggest problem is when you're postpartum and breastfeeding, your mucus symptom is going to be haywire. Um, that it's really, really difficult to read. It might look fertile, but you're not ovulating, you know. So, I mean, it's it's very confusing. That's not to say that women can't navigate it, right? Um, I know women who use mucus-only methods postpartum, love it, swear by it. Um, so, that's kind of the beauty of it is that there's no one-size-fits-all with fertility awareness, but all have postpartum protocols that you'll need to follow up with your instructor to get, and make sure that you keep in close contact. Perfect. Um, one of the questions we received from Instagram, and this is back on the issue of the pill. Um, do you think there is a correlation between the pill, breast cancer, and or miscarriages? Mm -hmm. Definitely a correlation with breast cancer because the pill is a known carcinogen. Um, and as far as miscarriages go, I don't know that there's definitely a connection, but I could easily see how, um, because what happens is when you come off the pill, because it wasn't identifying your hormonal imbalances and actually treating them, they're going to come right back. So let's say, for example, a woman had a progesterone deficiency. When she comes off the pill, if she becomes pregnant, deficiencies in progesterone, uh, progesterone is what sustains a pregnancy. 
So if you have deficiencies in progesterone, that would increase your risk of uh, miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And and I want to say here that that's definitely a possibility, um, but it's not 100% certain. And, and just like with any miscarriages, um, most of the time we don't know why miscarriages happen. And so... Exactly. Please, please don't take our assessment as you were on birth control and so you had a miscarriage. Right. And, but right. it it could be a possibility um, mm-hmm. in the list of possibilities. And I, and I will add this, you know, if a woman is watching this and has experienced a miscarriage coming off the pill, if there's any guilt there, we've all been lied to about the pill. You know, like you're operating on the information that your doctor gave you. There should be no guilt. Mm -hmm. Zero, zero, zero guilt. You know, I mean, we can, we can choose to be a force for good so that our daughters have better options, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's the way that I think about it is like, I am trying to make a better future for my daughter to grow up in a world where she can actually pursue these things and it's normal. (laughs) Right. I would love it. Yeah. All right, a couple more questions. I know we've kind of went long, but this is really good. <laughs> um, it feels weird talking about this kind of stuff with my husband. How do I approach fertility awareness with him? And I thought that you and I could both give our different perspectives with our husbands because we do things a little differently. And actually, um, I asked you this question already, and I thought your husband was did things differently so I was actually surprised by your answer but go ahead (laughs) yes um yeah well I mean you know there's nothing that can bring you closer together than talking about cervical mucus I mean you and I are testament to that um (laughs) uh but no it, it is an awkward conversation right it's not like an it's not something that we just naturally talk about um but that's kind of the whole point of marriage, right? Is that it's about that vulnerability. So I would just say like, if it is awkward, just say it's awkward. Just be like, front load the conversation with some caveats. I've done that so many times. Like, babe, look, I need to tell you something and it's really awkward and it's not going to come out right at first. So bear with me, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, and then, you know, just say what you need to say. And it just kind of creates a a better environment. I found that that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, I think that just kind of culturally, like we, we're not comfortable with talking about our cycles. So, you know, don't, don't put too much pressure. But um, one of the things that's pointed out as a perk of fertility awareness is that you get to share your fertility. And whenever I was learning fertility awareness, everybody was like, oh, that means that the guy logs in his chart, you know, what your reading was for the day. And it's like, I think I know probably about 5% of men who actually enjoy doing that. The other 95% could care less. Um, you know, and my husband, you know, I've, I've asked him to kind of like keep up to speed with what's going on. And it usually is, honey, you didn't ask me about my reading today. Oh, what was your reading? <laughs> That's about the level of it. <laughs> sharing the chart. But we share our fertility. It just, it's not by keeping the chart. Like he knows where I am in my cycle and we keep open communication about where we are with whether we want to um, avoid or achieve a pregnancy this cycle. And then we respect my fertility window, my fertile window accordingly, you know, mm-hmm. and that that's huge. You know, the fact that he's not like hanging his head low, like, Oh, it's like a window of abstinence. You know, he's like, yeah, no, this is what I signed up. Like to me, that's sharing. And it's, fantastic yeah so, and that um, that mutual respect is huge yes yeah 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 because he understands too like he's fertile all the time <laughs> right. the only reason why we're having to abstain during that window it's not because I'm fertile yet right <laughs> right well I had heard at the beginning of of learning about fertility awareness methods that the guy would chart for you and I literally could not imagine my husband doing that for me at all. And he doesn't. Yeah. He, I, yeah. I don't ask him to do that. I don't, I don't make him do that. Um, but we do talk about it a lot. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, you know, it's for me, it's more of a support thing because I'm learning a lot. I'm going through some ups and downs with, yeah. with the steep learning curve. And yeah. sometimes I've walked away from sessions really upset because I thought I was in a better place and I wasn't. And so it can take an emotional toll. Um, but with him, 
being willing to listen, even if he can't give me any advice on my you know, womanhood or whatever. It's just nice to have a partner that can, can listen to your problems. Um, and then, yeah, that mutual respect for when I, I should abstain from sex. Um, mm-hmm. But then there's also the issue with us where um, you don't want to be so rigid about like, here's your calendar and here are the days that you can have sex and here, you know, it, it it's, it is that, but you don't want to force like, we have to have sex on these days, you know? Right. And um, so having something that feels more genuine um, where I can initiate something or I can say no, um, uh-huh. it, it, just letting things flow like that instead of like, it, I, he doesn't like looking at a calendar and, and seeing, you know, when his window is. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. <laughs> Got a window of time, babe. Make use of that. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I will say, like, for me, too, like, there's something to be said for, like, I know that there's kind of like this emphasis on, like, sex needs to be spontaneous. But at the same time, like, so I know I know some people, like, when they schedule it, it's, like, so much better. You know, like for some people, they're just like, they're right. those planners that like, even if they plan their sex life, it's like, that's much better for us. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's kind of the beauty yeah. of it. You know, you can, you can navigate both of those things, I think. Yeah. Right. Um, and then we will end on this question. And this comes from Emily's Instagram. For those who are already practicing a method, how do we battle frustration when it seems so confusing and hard at times? Yeah, so I know that this question came from a newlywed. And so, you know, for Catholics, it's like, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, speak to the Catholic crowd a little bit more um, directly at first. Um, you know, we're told, like, no sex before marriage. And then when you ha- when you get married, you just, if you're going to have sex all the time, you accept all the babies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, all, like, when you walk into this world of sex and it's, like, it's great, And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait, now there's rules. Um, So there's like, you're told, we're told before we get married that like, oh, NFP is going to be the greatest thing for your marriage, you know, like unicorns and rainbows. Mm -hmm. And um, we get married and we realize like, no, this is actually like one of the biggest sources of problems for our marriage. And so I think, I think first of all, you have to adjust your expectations. Understand that what you were told, if that's the way you were told it, it's not the whole truth. What they were doing was they were selling you the resurrection, but they were hiding the crucifixion, right? You don't get one without the other, right? Mm -hmm. You don't get glory days without going through some rough times. Um, That the reason why this builds your marriage is because it forces you to kind of wrestle with your selfish nature, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's just, and that's not fun. Nobody has fun doing that, but that's part of what makes a good marriage, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you have to kind of adjust adjust your expectations and accept that the struggles and the frustrations are normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you come at it from that perspective, you're just you're set up in a much better way. Um, I wanted to I had my notes here, and I was going to add. Oh yeah, so culturally, you know, we kind of take it for granted that like family planning is supposed to be so easy, right? You just hop on birth control, you don't want a kid, and you hop off when you do. And so we kind of have this framework that, you know, all these things are easy, but marriage and sex and kids, these things are not easy. They take lifelong hard work. And, you know, I think if we just, if that becomes our expectation level when we encounter those things, we're like, oh, well, this is just marriage working like it should. This is normal. You know, incompatibilities and fights breaking out, whatever. This is just part of being married, you know, Mm -hmm. like working through those hard times, working through those miscommunications, misunderstandings. That's part of a normal, healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. That's good. I I think um, we don't want to sell fertility awareness as um, as perfect as the easy answer to everything. It, it's nope. you learning about your body and yeah. um, there's so many components, like you said, yeah. with marriage and with life. And so it's very holistic. Um, it affects every part of your life and 
it can be really, really hard. And then it can be really, really rewarding at the same time. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it, I, I feel like nothing is ever great unless there's a lot of effort behind it. And so, exactly. Exactly. so th- yeah. that's what we want to portray here is that um, it, it may not be easy all the time, but it's definitely rewarding and it's doable. Yeah. It's probably going to be one of the hardest things you ever do. Um, but the most worthwhile, Mm -hmm. you know, because you, it really teaches you to see just how interconnected all of the facets of you are. Right. Right. And that's, Mm -hmm. yeah, holistic. Right. Well, this was so good. I had a a lot of fun doing this with you, Emily. This is like mom's day out again. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Emily, for joining me. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. If you have more questions when this live is over, you can still drop your questions below and we will answer them. Um, If you would like to keep your question private, feel free to directly message us. We will get back to you in that way. And we will not um, put your question out there if it's if it's in that private nature. Um, Don't forget to head over to Emily's blog, TotalWine.com, for more information. That's Total, W-H-I-N-E, dot org. Or dot com, (laughs) sorry. Um, And then also please subscribe to our podcast, Engage with Eagle Forum. We have new episodes every Monday. We will, um, however, be taking a break this coming week because of Memorial Day, uh, but we will be sharing our top episodes and content with you throughout the week. So thanks again, everyone, and feel free to share this video with your friends. Um, Again, ask us any questions, and we will see you soon. (laughs) Thanks, Emily. Bye. Thanks so much for having me. Bye.